afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here, guys. Um, I like to move, but still audio. Sorry, it's, uh, I, I'll do my best to, and I'll do my best also not to uh, make you sleep, guys. Because I you know one hour when we talked about tech stuff, it could be uh, challenging. Happened to me when I went SIGGRAPH last time in, in LA. It was only a few months ago. I wanted to go and really follow some very very high end. Uh, uh, rendering uh, classes and my brain couldn't keep it, so after 10 minutes I was already done. So, so I'll try to be as entertaining as possible. Um, lighting, uh, how much of you guys, users in the group, do you know about lighting? Because I'd like to tailor this kind of this kind of presentation for you. So how much do you know about lighting? Uh, can you raise your hand if you know exactly what lighting is in game and visual effects? One, two, three. Okay, good. Yeah, just one there. Okay, cool. Okay, great. So, um, uh, I've been in visual effects, uh, so making movies, for about 16 years back in LA. And then I started back in LA to do AAA title games. And so I would say I've been in video games, in AAA video games, for about now seven years, seven, eight years. So I've been really witnessing something which all of us probably have been seeing, that the two industries are merging. But we keep talking about this, but we never really see some clear example. This until was a few months ago. I saw a, a small 30 second commercial production called CG Short, which was completely done with the uh, game engine, with the Epic engine. And that to me said, oh, this is finally happening. And so when they asked me, hey, Alberto, would you, would you mind to be part of MDEV and, you know, and share your knowledge, this is what I thought, guys, this is the time to really think about where we came from and what is about to happen. When? I, I don't know, but now it's going to happen for soon, sooner than 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we, we were talking about the full CG humans and full CG environment. This is happening, it's happening now. And so what I'd like to take you now is to a kind of time machine where you can see where we came from and what is about to happen in the next few years, which I think is really, really cool. So I also got the laptop from Tyler. Thank you, Tyler, because this incredible machine couldn't play in real time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> I, I always like to think about lining, guys. Lighting, I think that, especially in the game industry, it, I think it has, has been only kind of underestimated uh, because most of the time lighting is done by environment artists, right? Or by matte painter or by texture painter, whoever has to do most of the time because you don't have the budget to have a team only for lighting and or simply because you don't find the time to, to do lighting. So, but for me, lighting obviously is a big deal. I've always been a liner back in Hollywood and I grew up with being a lighting supervisor, lighting director. For me, lighting is what it gives the flavor, the mood, the passion, the emotion, everything to an image, right? So, and said that, if animation is horrible and the plot sucks, lighting cannot, cannot fix it, just to make sure. Lighting is not, you know, <laughs> I am aware I'm part of, the big, of this big machine and when I need our talent, I need many other people to make sure that we make a good product. So, lighting is just a part of it. And so this is what I was about to tell you, that uh, I can finally see, when you know, people told me, first of all, do you like movies, do you like games, do you like, I love, I love computer graphics, but I also love the idea to cheat the human eye, creating something which is not real. I said that, I also love painterly stuff, and Pixar is great, Pixar, you wouldn't say it's really photo real, even if it's from again, moving towards being photo realistic, uh, but, uh, what I think is happening now, talking about the future of this industry, is probably what I really like, is a product which is not a game, is not a movie, and it's not CG, actually it's all of them combined. And this is what I think is about to happen in the next probably 10 years, hopefully sooner. So, um, as I said, you know, the two industries are, are merging. So before we can really see how the future is, is going to look like. Um, as I told you, lighting is just a part of how we can make everything uh, meaningful and interesting. 
So uh, lighting with animation, as I said, and of course materials and texture and everything is what makes you know, your product uh, to look great or simply engaging. So I will try to speed up because I have a long, I have a long presentation. So 1977, you are not born. And if you were, I'm sorry, but me, uh, we are being the right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all think about Star Wars. We think about George Lucas. Uh, we think about California. Very likely, a few of you know, we, we know about Ireland, not Disney. And, but the reality is that that sequence is really, it's not the first one that went to the movies, actually. They made another one prior to that, which was even more crude. Uh, this is vector graphics, guys. And this was actually made in Chicago. So this was made by Larry Kuba in 1977, and was about two minutes of wide frame rendering. By the way, with your iPhone now, you can do 10 times more than you there with a big machine, right? And it um, was two minutes, and it took about 12 hours to render. And true story, um, the system had this huge mainframe. It kept crashing, 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 crashing. Monday, they had to go to film. Saturday was crashing, Saturday night, Larry Cuba turned off the air conditioning in Chicago, and this is when they got the sequence rendered. <laughs> oh, true story, you can Wikipedia, but it was, it was, it was amazing. So, uh, George Lucas then used it only, I think, 40 seconds out of the two minutes, but this is what made Star Wars. And this is what people think about, this is the first time you do visual effects, you do computer, you do CG for movies. And back then, this is what act, when in 1977 came out. So Atari came out uh, in 77. This is 1984, uh, Bob Abel and Associate, John Hughes uh, and, uh, um, and Robert uh, Stewart was a part of his team. Um, they made what I think was one of the most amazing commercial guys in 1984, right? Uh, uh, this was a, this was for the food for the uh, thing was a, was the corporation about food about canned food and uh, no shadows there is nothing reflection you can see even on the arm you you can see around here are kind of horrible but back then it was really chromy you know uh, for me this thing was only I started I went into the computer graphics 1986 so when I saw this stuff said whoa this was amazing let's see what was back then. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, right, there is, I mean, the two industries are still very far apart, right? Then, uh, have you ever heard of uh, Apollo computers? Apollo computers were before silicon graphics. And they were huge, right? They were kind of, again, huge machines that would take a lot of space. They need to be uh, liquid cool because it was super, you know, they were super hot to run. But this one was just a demo. It was not even a commercial. This, they didn't make money uh, with this thing. Was, again, it was just a demo for the company. And this was fully ray traced. And it is just an orgy of reflections. It was crazy. But it was the first time that you didn't see ray tracing happening. Right? And lighting, guys, it plans to be rendering. It's very difficult to say what is rendering, what is lighting. Very often, they have to overlap. right? And this what what was going on right there. Even 86, I guess you know it. Uh, besides animation, and by the way, John lasted there on this one. He was a modeler, he was a rigger, and was the animator, of course. So he did that everything. And um, it was quite funny because uh, this one. It is important why, well, besides it, it looks great, and I think the story, the idea to give the story, right, to a lab. But this is the first time that you have CG shadows. So we didn't have shadows until then. And this is what, what was happening at, at the same time. So we are still kind of far away, right? So, let me see. And in case you didn't,
if you look in uh, Toy Story and uh, Monstering, look for the ball. It's almost in every movie of Pixar. Movies and 
now we are really starting to use it a serious way. So, in few words, I try really to kind of summarize briefly what uh, the game industry took to ray tracing, to anti aliasing, motion blur, uh, IBL, I will explain you later what is uh, the image based lighting, ambient occlusion, HDR, and color grading, and more, obviously, more rendering techniques. And, uh, I'm, I'm not going into all the details, but it really took a lot. And so, if you heard about this uh, uh, this 30 second commercial, I think that uh, the amazing thing is all done in real time on a customized uh, Epic engine. But also, the interesting thing is being composited. And so, compositing is easy. So, composite guys, it means to is A over B, put an image over on top of another one, right? and you can have as many images as you want. Right? But the point is that somebody starts to think, wait a second, I don't want to render this. I don't want to render those cards. Those two cards are full CG. So the plate is live action. So the rows, if you work, is live action. And they motion track everything. They, they render in real time those cards. But the interesting thing is they composite it. So it means that in the future, even to make movies, well, for easy shot, I'm not going to render. I'm going to capture in real time from my real time engine. And this is a major difference, guys, because when I was at DreamWorks, we, we were using render for We got a thousand of cars. At Sony, I was doing the rendering, it was I am legend, and I was using like at least 3,000 props only for my sequence because I needed to render. Now, now very soon, we don't have an engine, a real time, a game engine, really. Because this is what the game industry is really approaching the visual effects. You know, a game engine will render uh, our images.
if you zoom in, uh, when the clip keeps going, you zoom in to the headlight, all the details, all the caustic effects, all the reflection is, is simply amazing. This is done by the mail, which is a visual effects company. They have no game experience, but they're using a, re a game engine to do this kind of part. And this is what I think is really interesting. Uh, I think it was sure the first time probably a C graph, uh, but I, I still didn't see uh, a lot of noise or feedback because I think this is really amazing, guys. I mean, in terms of quality and the fact is in real time, uh, it, it's really, it's really impressive. So, uh, to, let's see, as well. So, before we go to that, what I wanted to tell you about, for example, the car, I was thinking, uh, I, I'm a kind of racing guy, I know. I may call it duty, but my thing is to have a wheel or a steering, something. And so I'm um, playing Forza. Think about you, the next movie, you know, you could have a, a movie about NASCAR, about F1, whatever, right? So shot in Hollywood, live action, real actor, or CG actor. And then at a certain point, during the story, where you're driving, this is where you choose, no, this is gonna be a game. No, 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 I'm gonna drive. No, I'm gonna, I'm going inside of the car, and I'm gonna race the movie. And this is what I think is really cool, guys. We're getting to the point where movies and games uh, really start to be really, really close. If you look at Forza or Gran Turismo Sport, it looks pretty amazing. There are still a few things, but it's just beautiful. So what is missing? I think a CG human, obviously, is the last part, is the last piece of, of the puzzle, right? So I found uh, I found this demo, which I thought was, 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 was very interesting. This is all real time. The quality of the skin, you have the soft surface, the lighting changes. Thank you. 
it was created. So, so now, uh, for example, in the new game coming, we have a super high res, super you know, uh, complex shaders for the skin, and is real time. So, so this is what I, I was about to tell, right? So, where I think it, my point of view is that where games and movies are are going is that you're gonna download, you're gonna stream. Something I, I cannot call it movie. I cannot call it game. You will download an entertainment product, something that is you can let it play because it has already preset. There is a plot, there's a narrative. You have the characters, so you can just watch it. You can Netflix it, or say, "Oh, this is cool." You're gonna have the option to stop, not to stop it, to take a turn. And now you take your game pad, when it's gonna be, and you start to play the movie. And you can go to the end of the movie, or you can just, okay, I enjoy this moment, I talk to this character, I have to cook something, I let the movie run again. So, because technology exists, and, and, it, and it seems like a lot of people are really working towards that. So, I think this was the first part, guys. And um, we have a few minutes, so um, if you want, you, you have a few questions? If not, I can probably jump on to the next one, if you have a quick break. I'm trying to. Yes. Uh, the last part came about uh, you saying, like, you going to go cook something and let the AI take yeah. over and play the game for you or you know, yeah. continue on. Uh, in recent stuff that we have, like, any games that you could mention that are, are that is already doing something esque? If they already did it, I think I'm going to show you here. <laughs> I mean, like, I wouldn't say, like, absolutely that same way, but, like, uh, preliminary. Like settings for it, like you know, when uh, I think there's like a cookie, there's a cookie game where you can just start doing it and then it just starts making cookies. Yeah, well, well. It, but yeah, that is based on the algorithm that's going to be a like same CPI. Mm -hmm. You just start it and it will be whatever, right? Yeah. So uh, I think it's that in that sense, the kind of AI approach of what it exists, uh, what does not exist uh, is the narrative approach. How can I break the narrative? And now the engine has to think about the different narrative now. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna do three bacon, three different narratives? So it's like when you do when you do gameplay, you attack A, B, and C. I have a narrative, are you gonna give the option A, B, and C? I think it must be more than that, because people are not gonna buy it. If, I, if, if you feel I can choose only between kill the guy, save them, or just don't look at them, it's still a game, it's not a movie, right? So, I think that there's people back there are scripting and you know designing games that have a different challenge. You have to try to figure it out. Any other quick question about CG lining? We're gonna go in, into a more technical or technical and more about the tools and what PBR and CG lining means. So uh, still more images, but yes. Okay. Um, I actually just played a game and it, it didn't have to do with the CG side of things, but it basically played the movie and you could choose options at different points. I think there are like 100 options, or like 150 outcomes based on like 50 scenes. But it was like, it felt it was a movie that you like, drew at different points. Yeah. Now, thank so, you. So it's not 3D, but yeah. definitely. Thank you. So I think now on top of that kind of structure, you put all the technology to visually make it look real. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be amazing. So I see people already doing that. And honestly, I, to me, to play a movie game for uh, 17, I think I would do it. For me, it would be cool. Probably more than VR. I don't know, because VR is still now, I feel I'm kind of, I have to wear a hat or something. This one is just. What do you think about like a cop that is like the average consumer? Because like I saw a really demo of like the new Final Fantasy concept that they came up with where you had to wait ten thousand dollars because of four graphics card in just to run that one demo that they have that's the most realistic for games. So what, what where do you think that point will be where people can buy the product and still have a realistic playing experience like how much you think? I think until the price becomes available to User, and the average is not the guy who can spend 10 million dollars. It will never bloom. <coughs> the industry will never have a 
change. But I think maybe figure out eventually even Oculus Rift it will come down in price, right? If it will be cheaper, I would say, yeah, why not? Let me try it. Let me play now if I have to pay for five hundred. Uh, sure, let me think about it. Maybe I prefer to buy something else. Right? So the technology is coming down a lot. Uh, again, I think in the nineteen eighties, you know, you, you needed to you, for to render wireframe in twelve hours. Now we we are in real time on on to an iPhone. Actually, we are ray tracing app for your iPhone. Believe it or not, yeah, we're actually some heat right now. <laughs> and and other things. Yeah. I was gonna say um, this entire thing was focusing on realistic renderings and making it look as, mm -hmm. as real to life as possible. But as the technology gets better and um, the ability to recreate these things, you can also twist reality and make uh, yeah. cell shaded. You can do scanner darkly type things and totally. reducing that kind. Totally. Yeah, I wanna I wanna be clear. Uh, I am more kind of you know fool your eye kind of artist, but I love anything that is engaging, something that is visually interesting. I don't care if it doesn't look perfectly real. I know that is a style, right? If if you do something that is more artistic or more painterly, and you find the right balance of colors and shapes and gameplay, I love it. Actually, what we are trying to do. Um, the next Call of Duty, uh, the next Call of Duty is gonna, we're gonna work with the company which is notoriously hyper-realistic. It means it's not photoreal. It means they push the color crazy, uh, they do something that I wouldn't call photoreal. And what we're trying to do now is to mix the PBR approach, so to be, able to be scientifically, to realistic, correct, you know, for the tech, but now twisted to, to that style, so. I think that, that it's easy. If you can match reality, then you can break it. Yeah. I think the opposite is more difficult from my point of view. The opposite is way more difficult. You know, when, when something doesn't look right and you have to take it to the next level, not everybody can do it. Sure. If there are no, no other questions, I think I can jump to the next one. So, um, for some of you, will be probably, I mean, very well known for these things that are coming up next. Uh, again, some of you will know. So for some of our probably will be newer information, so I apologize if I try to really surf. I'm, I'm, I'm really going to skim over the surface of, of this uh, technology. So, um, you heard the majority of you what PBR is. I mean, uh, PBR, by the way, I came up with a different terminology, which is politically based rendering. <laughs> which, uh, because, uh, so if you ever hear, it's coming from me, nobody else. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and the simple reason is, uh, when you make something that is uh, photoreal, or is physically based, uh, sometimes it doesn't look nice. Why does it look nice? Well, uh, you know, reality is not always colorful and beautiful to play. So our directors sometimes say, oh, first, damn, you match, it looks real. But it's not fun. There is no, there is no, uh, how can I say, there is no a cool or a freshness, so it's not interesting if you work. So this is when the PBR starts to fall apart and people start to break it. And when people start to break it, they get really attached and say, this is the right way to do the PBR. And this is when I start to say, no, this is politically this way. You know, it's your, your own idea. So, uh, long story short, PBR obviously is physically based on it. And uh, I'll let you read, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to annoy you, but it's really based on physics. I would jump to the second part, right, on to the simpler terms. So, again, the goal is always to fool your eyes. The goal is to create a set of rules, a set of tools that will allow you to create something, let's say, that is going to take too much time, it's going to be too complicated, and, and it's going to allow you to create something that it does look real. So, uh, why I'm talking about PBR? This is a class about lighting. Well, a PBR, you know, technology and lighting have to be together. You cannot just know about PBR. So if you are assigned to develop a share or to tweak a share or just to make one for your game, which is PBR, and you don't know anything about lighting, you will fail. There is no way. You need to talk to a lighter, or when you do that, you need to at least figure it out. Am I going to use an HDR image? 
what kind of value, what's, what's, what's going to be the EV value of all my scene. So when you do that, then you can be 100% sure your PBR materials are correct. It means you can still dial them, you can create them, but as, until you put light, you don't know that if they are really correct. And especially if they look right. So PBR usually is between two sets, two families, right? So you have a metals and non metals. And, and this is just, a, I think, a very simple. And for me, obviously, the quick thing is just spec, right? Spec, which is, you know, in, back in visual effects. By the way, Pixar, when you saw this movie back then, we had the ambient, the diffuse, and specular separate, right? Then when we learn that spec doesn't really exist, spec is reflectivity, this is when we finally came up with the idea of this PBR, so now we have to think in a, in a different way. And personally, being an art director, myself, I hate the PBR for one reason, because sometimes, again, I need to polish, I need to make something that looks nice for that specific moment, for an IGC or something. <coughs> and the fact that I cannot add a spec alone because in order to expect, I, I need to modify my reflection, it kind of bothers me. <laughs> but reality, PBR, if you do it right, if you set your materials right, and you have a, a decent lighting set, set up, it should look right. You, you should not have to tweak. So uh, this is what I was telling you about the difference about spec, and obviously, Diffused, I'm, I'm assuming that when I talk about spec, diffused majority of you understand, so I'm, I'm not going to explain too much, but you can see how the light is bouncing and uh, reaching the camera. So. And why spec and diffuse are important? Well, because if you know your spec value and you know your diffuse value, now you can mix them and you can find the right, uh, the right balance between what is supposed to be a rough material versus a very glossy and specky one, right? So I think this is marble set, I think. And uh, I think this is, this, is, this is a great example. So every surface, you know, the Luxor Junior, the lamp, uh, you know, back then they had uh, other problems, which was about just to render. So maybe the lamp of the seventy was maybe ten thousand points, maybe not even that, maybe less. And uh, and so today we can afford so much power when we render our object, our geo, that we can add these tiny scratches. Can you imagine the Luxor Junior lamp with tiny scratches on it? Oh my God! You got the close up. No, John Lasseter would go nuts, right? We start to create. Uh, Beautiful view of the lamp, all those things, right? So, and you can do that in real time now with a you know, real epic engine. So, so something which is very important: why PBR? Again, having a team is important. Well, when we make movies, uh, each artist used to tweak the shader just to make it look right for the shot. So, Spider-Man is flying. Oh, my suit is not really nice. So, I go inside to look at inside the material, and I tweak it. So with my lighting, it looks great. Yeah, but continuity-wise, it creates a huge problem. Because now every artist is going to tweak the shader. And, and, you know, every map is going to look different again. It's not going to be right. With PBR, if it's set right, you have it, you set it, and nobody has to worry about it. And it's, and it's supposed to look right. If it doesn't look right, it's because lighting is not perfect. And this is what I want to say, right? PBR makes it easier for artists to treat assets. So, so uh, how many of you have you heard of HDR? Oh, perfect, okay. So, please don't fall asleep. I'll be trying to be fast on this one. So, um, I think that uh, we all know we can easily skip that. So, um, the point is, often, uh, personally, I don't always go back to the graph to understand, really. I know how to use HDR, I shoot it, I, I understand, I know to apply, I know to manipulate, stay away from Photoshop, use anything else, please. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, but I, think, uh, I think we tend to forget about the roll-off, right? So, being in LDR and HDR, why I go back to this graph? Well, because now we're going to have HDR display. So, in, you know, in the 80s, at, at, at the end of the 80s, we came up with the HDR 
images. So, and we start to now, now we can take a shot or, or on set when you know, they're shooting a CG plate. We can, we, we can take a panorama, it's HDR, I go back, I load it in Maya or in my game, I use it, uh, the lighting is almost, it's not completely perfect, it's like 70%, okay? But then I don't care, why? Well, because it goes on film. Film is not HDR, not until now. <laughs> now HDR technology is becoming more common and common. I'm waiting myself for the next, uh, um, Thanks, give me the, the Black Friday because I'm gonna get an HDR TV because now I need one. And the point, eventually, even the next production, I mean, YouTube, you can have, you know, there is a part, I didn't know, there is a small section of YouTube which is in HDR, so you can play clips in HDR. So, the point is, if you don't have an HDR monitor, useless, right? So, this one is important, guys, because when I go on film with my HDR, the white is gonna clip. Clip it means it, it will go flat, okay? You're gonna lose the detail in your spec, in your highlight, right? But now you're gonna see. And so to remind yourself that when you when you are handling an HDR piece of information, you always have to be careful of the high, the bottom part too, most of the time of the high level, make sure you don't clip them. And, 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 and it's easy if you go into an LDR pipeline just for a second. I have an HDR image, but when I take it into an LDR pipeline, it means that my real-time engine does not output in HDR. So you have to be very careful. This is the obvious difference between LDR and HDR. Again, just a, a very simple render where you can see obviously how the spec, everything, you know, I would say it's at least one stop brighter. But again, you know, the major difference in HDR is the arrangement you get from, you go from zero to 255 in Photoshop, right? In the HDR, you go as far as you can shoot, as far as you can have. Mm. Does anybody here figure out how to paint, fully paint 32 bit in HD, in, in HDR pic, picture? Yeah. Photoshop, uh, if you're trying to paint in HDR, to try to mask it, or just, just to do any uh, painting uh, work, is not gonna let you do it. So what you have to do, you have to down rest to 16 bit, which is what some companies do. Actually, we're working with a company which is, does this process. Why? Because the artists are so comfortable with Photoshop, but they don't want to learn Nuke, which is not a painting tool, but want to Nuke for another tool, which is full, 32 bit flow. And what happens when you go 16 bit, uh, you're going to clip uh, the nice part, which is what you want to keep, and then you want to stretch it back to 32, which is, uh, which is not great. But uh, I'm always wondering if anybody feel, uh, has, has figured out the way to paint in full 32 bit. And this is a, a this is idea, what I was telling you before. I uh, used it, for example, back then for a shot of uh, Spider-Man. Something that you may say, well, they look pretty the same, just brightness difference, right? But it's just some um, color. But, uh, hopefully, uh, if you look there, uh, now you see that you get an automatic bounce. So when you use an HDR, and this is just using light. So it means it takes time. Uh, I need to have a lighter that is going to be carefully placed light. I have to make sure, you know, again, you know, the sun is not going to give me, the sky is not going to give me any bounce. So I need an artist to say, hey, add another light to feel light to leave a blue to get a little bounce. With an idea, which means image based light, which means I use an HDR most of the time on the sphere or just the engine, it just knows how to use it, and automatically it does that. So when we talk about IBM, let's not confuse also, it's not gonna give you the sun. The sun is a different story. <laughs> <laughs> so IBM most of the time is for the bay component, for the bounce light, for all what makes it feel real. But when you wanna cast shadows or those things, you still need to put the sun. So and this is what is happening here. But the sky box, so the IBM part of it, is giving me all these nice, uh, you know, blue uh, pixels in the, in the image, which I think is really nice. 
another example, right? So we all saw this, but uh, I think this is very uh, explanatory. So, um, color green. This is for me is another big deal. And it's lighting, but again, it's, I would say 50% is lighting. Uh, there is a bit theory. Some art directors and some DP, they want to color correct uh, as much as they can on set. So when you make your game, you add the blue light, you know, you know, you know, red light. So you try to add as much color and vibe as you can, and you just really go post after. Or what now everybody tends to do in game now is probably the opposite, to try to add a very little color in their life, let the environment do what needs to be done, and then in post, you're gonna give a flavor, you're gonna give a style, you, you, you're gonna give a look like. So, um, color, uh, color grading is really the process to create the look, to create the style. And uh, until a few years ago in games, uh, we Obviously, we had the C-Lat with a few things to adjust colors, but now with the HDR, oh, with a full range, we're using actually the same tools that we're using visual effects to color correct <coughs> your C lat So, the point, as I was telling you guys, everybody was excited. We have HDR, oh, we have HDR TV. The point is, <laughs> I was talking to an engineer in LA, the guy working for Treyarch, and he said, Sony, uh, LG, Samsung, they are now creating this HDR TV, but there are no standards. There are really no standards out there. In which color space? 2020? Yeah, usually what the company is using, but it's not the standard. Dolby, Dolby has its own standard. And so even when it comes to make games, there are no standards. But I was Googling, like, how can I set up my Sony HDR to work in 2020 with Windows? And there is nothing up there. There is really nothing. It's a first time that what is useless because we are pioneering. There is no information yet. So at the Raven, we purchased the first HDR monitor that Dell was making. Uh, I think it was uh, we purchased like uh, two months, uh, three months ago, and we we were the first one to get it. We were excited. And the point is, Windows doesn't see. And so we have to figure out now the NVIDIA driver to work. And we couldn't we couldn't find any help. It took us engineer to figure out it was a nightmare. And in the end, there is two grand for one monitor, so a little pricey if I have to give it to 20 artists. And in the end, I don't, I don't think it was that great. I don't think it was. But just to let you know, HDR, great, exciting, but we still don't know really what we are doing yet. We're still trying to figure it out. So I want to go back uh, before we talk a little more tech stuff. If any of you will have a chance to work uh, with uh, color grading, so color grading to keep a color, right? To keep a style. Uh, I, I always go back to Roger Deakins set, right? Which uh, it's easy to make color look good, but it's very different. It's way harder to service the narrative, to service the story. And this is what uh, you know. Coming from movies, I usually pay pay more attention. Uh, colors, it, it means emotion. Colors connect to emotion. So uh, now there is, you know, like David Fincher, there are many directors very love a teal and orange. Uh, every time, teal and orange. <laughs> and I get it, is is a trend, and I like it. So there's nothing wrong with teal and orange. But there are other colors. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is what, uh, this is, guys, actually 1930. 1936, 1937, so is more than yesterday. Uh, this guy came up with this wheel that connects, the, that creates a link between emotion and colors. And I found it very, very interesting. And he thought that the eight primary emotions, which anger, fear, sadness, disgust, and blah, 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 right? So when we pick color and then we be complementary or, or the one that you, you, you're going to couple with, just don't go like, oh, it looks nice. Why? Why it looks nice? Try to understand why you pick the color. And if you figure it out, then you can also elaborate and create something more interesting. For the World War II game, for the next Call of Duty, uh, what we did, uh, I went through all the maps, uh, not just the Raven, also Sledgehammer, we went through all the maps. And we were trying to to instill a little bit of one unique color in the fog, in the background, 
Vis visually, you're not gonna see it, it's not gonna be that strong, but subliminally, you're gonna feel it. Because every map has to be part of what I call the emotional color script. So we start with one mood, and we wanna end up with another one, and we try to take you there slowly with small increments of colors. This is what, uh, sorry, it's too, it's not 4K. And uh, so these are the colors uh, that they usually connect to certain emotions. So again, I apologize if it's not the high resonant. This is, is an example of what we've been using, which is Resolve. Uh, is a, for us, it's the best way to color grade our steel app. And, uh, this thing, this is fun, this is nice. Everybody can know how to use a Premiere After Effects. You can do it, but what we really care is this part. Why? Because here, I can set my mid range, my value, and if I go below, I know my blacks are clipping more than anything else around here. So this is nice and powerful, but when you choose a tool, try always to have the waveform or some kind of histogram because it's really helpful. On your TV, it looks great on your friend, it may look horrible. So, see uh, that, I'm sure you know already, all of you, or quite majority of you, what is a see that, practically your entire game stays inside here. And when you call it, when we call it gray, we call it gray, we, we take a screenshot, or actually we can do also live with the game running, so we call it practically gaming live. But eventually, all this color correction we do, so more blue, less red, it goes into this image. We cook it, we export it as an, as an EXR, and then the engine is gonna uh, use it again. So, um, <coughs> 4K, as I was telling you, right, 4K, funny enough, it, it's kind of old of it because about 8K already. I was <laughs> reading last night, that was, I was telling my wife that uh, Stranger Things 2 has been shot 8K with the new red camera. Can your eyes see the difference of that one? <laughs> you know what? I was very skeptical until I saw Call of Duty in 1500 HDR on 4K. When I saw it, I said, oh, that was beautiful. I said, I, I want one, right? So if it's dialed, if the HDR value are dialed the right way, if if, if your characters, if your environment has enough poly, because now you're gonna have 8K. On 4K, I can tell you already, what looks great on your TV, on a 4K, nice 4K, ooh, the geo is no, it doesn't work, the price is horrible, you know, the generation is. So, 8K, I, you know, I think yes, I think you can see the difference. I think that Netflix, they wanted to do it because in, in the future, when they're gonna probably reissue, maybe the bundle, you know, Stranger Things 1, 2, and 3, 4, whatever, how many they're gonna do, back then it's gonna be 8K. I mean, Netflix is already streaming 4K. So, maybe in a few years it's gonna be 8, and so they wanna be ready. They shot 8K, so, yeah. But the point is also, when you think about shooting, shooting 8K, uh, think how much terabytes of information. 16K is interesting, it's, it's gonna be interesting. So, very quickly, guys. Um, do you know the difference between REC 709 and REC 2020? Uh, REC 2020 is the HDR standard. Every time, if you buy an HDR TV, whatever, the, TV, the signal is gonna get your PlayStation, Xbox, PC, whatever, and it's gonna convert into 2020. This is the standard now that most of the manufacturer, TV manufacturer. The 709, still some TV do use it. If you're not HDR, most of the time it's back. Uh, sRGB is the one that computer you can use it. If you have a good monitor like an HP, green color, you can switch between 7 and 9, but you can see the difference in range. So when you color correct something and you put it on the HDR, keep an eye on your green and on your purple because this is where the colors are gonna be off. So, so very important to know your color space. And as I mentioned to uh, a few people before, um, I think needs value, guys. When you go Best Buy, when, 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 when you go Costco, they don't tell you. There is no needs value. You can, sure, that price, that the contrast. Contrast is, is another big one, sure. But the needs value practically is, is the brightness, right? How bright. Um, so, 
one need is equivalent to one candela per square meter, right? That is a technical, it's a scientific uh, terminology. The point is, more needs you have, and brighter it is. So, small example, in Call of Duty, we have a feature, we call it veil. It's one of the post process. The veil practically gives, uh, this blue around light, right? So automatically the engine is gonna make it a little softer, so even nice bloom for the light, right? So we always did that in every game, and now with the HDR, when we look up and we look at the sun, oh my God, since we are HDR, we are PBI, and our sun is really bright, now the HDR TV, since we have a, an HDR TV, which is about here, is about 15 underneath, oh my God, the sun, I cannot look at that. I was inside this artist office and I had shadows behind me. <laughs> Sharp shadows, it was amazing. And so uh, the reason why then we had to purchase an HDR TV for the studio, we purchased 25 of them, so it was an investment. Uh, the point, we wanted something which is gonna really give you, so if you're expecting to be whoa, but amazing, it's not just the 4K, but it's also the need to make, the need to that. So anything, anything below 500, don't even purchase it. Don't even, don't get close, it's just a waste of money. It's not really HD. It's not gonna, you know, it's gonna be brighter. It's not gonna be, whoa, it's really like the real life, right? Perfect, on time. <laughs> so, sorry guys, I tried to rush it, but uh, I, have the, I have the mean guy there telling me. Any questions? I think we can have a few minutes to go through. I try to really like a, a flat pebble and try to skim on to something that can be difficult. Yes, sir. So you spent a lot of time talking about the really high end of, of things with 4K yes. and 8K and whatever, but you yeah. also have to design for all people who don't have that stuff. I mean, how much do you kind of gear your overall lighting, rendering, color to the high end? Right that's a, that's that's actually a good question because this is what the funny enough even for the stranger things too, when they shot it, they they already thought about people are gonna watch it on the iPhone, for real. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously, you know, making a, a kind of famous game, you wanna try to please your average, your average, you know, uh, consumer, and at the same time, you wanna try to show off a little bit your product. So for me personally, we are telling everything to be HDR as good as possible. And honestly, we are not going 1500 minutes. We are going for the thousand, which is what you buy uh, best buy. By the way, there's a difference also between LED and OLED. Uh, OLED tends to have less meat, but they are deeper black. So as long as you have in a dark environment, you're gonna get the same punch like a bright 1500 minute panel in normal light. Normal light. So, so to go back to your question, I think that uh, we care about all the players. <laughs> so it's not that uh, we, know we care only that. But uh, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult because uh, simply uh, your wife's are gonna clean on, 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 on a small device. Uh, I'm sure the next OS is gonna be fully HDR. Not just HDR taking feature, but HDR as a hardware, as a display. I can't wait because I know eventually millennials and newer generation are going to use this thing more and more. So uh, technology, the way we did, uh, was for me was a big deal is to make sure that the HDR, when you translate it to the LDR, which is this one, or a non-HDR monitor, at least color-wise, is pretty close. So this is what actually we spent a lot of time a few months ago to make sure that the color conversion from the HDR to the lower level is good. But it is tricky, right? Yeah, the aspect ratio changes and everything. So. Yes? Uh, so I was just curious, um, color grading and things is such a, something that's been around for so long. Is there a good jumping point to start learning that skill set as someone not in the film industry? Um, it, it's you know, very slowly becoming part of the... the yes, there are actually, uh, there are a couple of PDFs available. If you Google color correction movies and color correction, you will find a couple of them which uh, are gonna sample uh, like 15, 20 movies, and they're gonna tell you why, you know, Spielberg chose that one, because Fincher loves this one, and they're gonna really explain to you 
I think sometimes that hey, this happened for me too. I need to be big. I, I need to be baby sit and say, oh, I love red, but I wasn't really connected to anger or to passion. Right? It's very subliminal. So online, luckily, you don't have to pay but a couple of decent PDF. And then I think it's really more about how you feel. Really. If you know, it, because it doesn't mean that yellow is the same meaning. But for me, that you may feel, that you may experience. It. So. Uh, Honestly, less is better. <laughs> less is better. Especially when it comes to color. For me, so, I mean, a, a lot of companies, they tend to pump a lot of colors. And I understand for marketing, too, it's always a good idea because you need color, color, color. Because again, you know, guys, I mean, consumer today, they have a fine minutes and they say, yeah, I'm doing this one. Oh, this is fun, okay. If it's not bright enough, it's not colorful enough for me, you know, you know, I get, you know, the persistent player. I mean, eventually they will not play, right? So I understand that. But at the same time, personally, I think that color is very powerful and it can be used a smart way. It doesn't have to be crazy all over. You can have few objects, you know, maybe have a 20% saturation more than the rest of the environment, and it still makes it interesting. And you don't know why, but your brain feels that there is more color in that object. And then you support the narrative, you know? It could be a, a target.